Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstores virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator and Community Bookstores celebrating over 50 years in business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all sincerely for spending the evening with us. Um, I'm very thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Alex Andreas, Saskia Hamilton, Daryl Pinckney, and Merve Emre for a discussion of the uncollected essays of Elizabeth Hardwick, edited by Alex and forthcoming from NYRB Classics. So now to some housekeeping before I introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. You can submit them there and we will be asking them at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting the link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we will try to resolve them quickly. We have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring and summer, so head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is on Wednesday, June 1st. We're thrilled to welcome Mark Haber for the, sorry, Mark Haber for his new book, St. Sebastian's Abyss, in conversation with Hillary Lecter. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Alex Andreas was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1985. His stories, essays, and poems have appeared in Granta, the Review of Contemporary Fiction, Prodigal, and Literary Imagination. He has translated several works from Italian and French, including Roberto Baslin's Notes Without a Text and Other Writings, and François René de Chateaubriand's uh, Memoirs from Beyond the Grave, 1768 to 1800, which is an NYRB classic. Saskia Hamilton edited Words in Air, the complete correspondence between Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell with Thomas Travisano. Robert Lowell's The Dolphin, two versions, 1972-1973. The Letters of Robert Lowell and The Dolphin Letters, 1970 to 1979, Elizabeth Hardwick, Robert Lowell, and Their Circle. Her poetry collections include Corridor from 2014, Canal, New and Selected Poems from 2005, Divide These from 2005, and As for Dream, 2001. She is a professor at Barnard, where she currently serves as vice provost. Daryl Pinckney selected the New York stories of Elizabeth Hardwick and the collected essays of Elizabeth Hardwick for NYRB Classics, a longtime contributor to the New York Review of Books, he is the author of the novels High Cotton and Black Deutschland, and of several works of nonfiction, most recently the collection Busted in New York and Other Essays. He has collaborated with Robert Wilson on the director's productions of The Forest, Time Rocker, Orlando, The Old Woman, Letter to a Man, Garincha, Street Opera, and Mary Said What She Said. And Merve Emre, who will be moderating tonight's conversation, is Associate Professor of English at the University of Oxford. She's the author of Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Post-War America, The Ferrante Letters, and The Personality Brokers. She's finishing a book titled Post-Discipline, Literature, Professionalism, and the Crisis of the Humanities, and writing a book called Love and Other Useless Pursuits. She's a contributing writer at The New Yorker. Her essays and criticism have, have appeared in The New York Review of Books, Harper's, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and The London Review of Books. So now without any further ado, I will pass the screen off to you for, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Noah, and welcome everybody. I thought we might start our conversation with a question that the NYRB imprints posed when they were advertising this event, which is why is everyone talking about Elizabeth Hardwick these days? And I thought I would hand that question over to the three of you who have edited uh, her essays, her letters, her occasional pieces, to just say a couple of sentences uh, before we turn to the essays in the uncollected about why we have witnessed this renewal of interest, if that's indeed what it is, in Hardwick's work as an essayist, a critic, a novelist, and as Joyce Carol Oates put it, a mini miniature biographer, a miniaturist biographer. So can I ask Alex to kick that yes. off? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I think all the all the things that seem to come up in review after review and essay after essay about Hardwick, she's such an interesting stylist, as everyone says, and um, and I think that has perhaps become clearer with the appearance of the collected essays, and you can see uh, 
how that style evolved and you can see how it is different in uh, Sleepless Nights than it is in the essays, but also how similar it can be. Um, and sort of learning her music. But I think also um, uh, that there's a way in which she, she addresses, you, one feels addressed by Hardwick still uh, in a way that one doesn't necessarily feel addressed by a lot of essayists um, from, from her generation um, at this point. Um, but at the same time, she is still very much, you know, not, she's still very much of her generation. She's, and I think that distance, that, that feeling of being addressed and that she's still talking about issues uh, whether it's technology or abortion rights that we're talking about today uh, in ways that are extremely um, useful and interesting and insightful. But then, of course, she's coming at it from a, an older perspective, from a different perspective, from a perspective that isn't really accessible to most of us anymore. So those are a few thoughts anyway. Saskia, can, do you want to jump in? Well, I think that when um, when the New York Review of Books um, uh, reissued um, the um, Daryl's editions of, uh, um, of of her of her essays, um, uh, I think that just she was back in print. She was she was back on people's minds, um, and um, um, I think encountering her um, again or encountering her anew, and I think. Um, I mean, I don't have any any thoughts really about sort of bigger cultural issue, issues and reading trends and that sort of thing. But I think that one thing that I that that I myself find so wonderful in rereading her is how um, unpredictable um, the movement of her thinking is, and how exciting it is to read anything by her. Um, just. Uh, just to watch where her mind leaps um, and the way it leaps. Um, and in her, um, um, you know, the, the style that everyone indeed, as Alex was saying, talks about, um, um, although that style itself is um, very hard to characterize uh, for me. Um, but I think that, 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 that just the, the, freshness of it and the, the movement of her mind and the, the in peculiarity of it. Um, I think it's just very exciting to encounter again. Um, so, and then like Alex, I also think the distance of time makes us look at writers of that generation in new ways. Um, and um, given, the, given the, the renewed attention to other writers of that generation, including the poets that she, um, was uh, she knew very well Elizabeth Bishop and indeed Robert Lowell, um, some of the others. I think that um, um, turning uh, people turning their attention to this magnificent prose writer is uh, is both a great thing and 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 um, happily surprising and unsurprising. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Those are just some thoughts. No, those are great. Daryl, would you like to jump in? Well, certainly uh, it has everything to do with her voice, singularity of voice. Um, and um, I think uh, for someone who worked very hard to uh, make the page come alive, she kept through revision after revision, this sort of freshness of thought of, you know, discovering happening on the right image or metaphor. So the writing is still very alive. I think because of what she represents uh, as an intellectual and something about her makes it okay for her to have this very literary sensibility that at the moment would be perhaps attacked in others. Uh, but she has somehow an exemption from a lot of the Philistinism uh, that's around at the moment. Maybe she's a kind of refuge or haven or mm. beacon for uh, you know, a kind of unapologetic engagement with literature. It's always uh, 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 an essay after essay, her own experience is immediately translated through what she's read. You know, she always finds a kin kinship uh, in literature right away so that she's not alone. 
Yeah, I, I was I was thinking something very, very similar, which is that what's so striking about her to me is that deep, deep and very earnest commitment to the idea that literature might help us see the patterns in our own lives, that it might bring form to a kind of chaos, I, especially to the most chaotic moments of one's life. And I thought maybe we could turn to an essay where I think that argument is being made throughout, which is the ties women cannot shake and have from the uncollected essays. So I think one of the things that Alex has done that is really wonderful in the uncollected essays is that he has grouped the essays thematically. And one of the major themes is what Alex calls feminine principle. And I like that, I like that very much. And this is the section that contains essays with titles like The American Woman a Snow Queen, The Feminine Principle, Women Re Women, Is the Equal Woman More Vulnerable, Suicide and Woman, and The Ties Women Cannot Shake and Have. And I thought maybe I could just read one paragraph for us from that essay so that we could talk about it and so that everybody listening could be on the same page even if they're not literally <laughs> on the same page. So the self always matters, no matter how great the crisis and disruption of the world. If you are allowed to live, your singular solitary self will be gnawing at you all the time. You never wish to surrender the whole of yourself to the general. We do not want to be engulfed in the universal but interferences are everywhere, in the nature of things, in the recalcitrance of others, in the world of accident, necessity, circumstance. Our desires war with those of our fellow men. Dispersion, loneliness, rootlessness, these are carried on the wind like a pestilence. Everywhere one goes, there are young or middle-aged women raising their children alone. You will be aware of an absence presently growing beside you like a tree, the same Sylvia Plath poem said. It is called for a fatherless son and it does not refer to the downtrodden and orphaned, but to the children left by the educated, sophisticated man when he has changed his mind. Now, I think maybe all three of us referenced this essay as one of the essays that we wanted to discuss. And I would just, really love to hear what the three of you think about the argument that's being made there about the self and the relationship between the self and the universal, but also the turn throughout this essay to Plath in order to make sense of one's love for one's child, one's sense of abandonment, uh, and, and I think also to sort of wag a finger at the children, at the educated, sophisticated man who would leave his child when he changes his mind. So those are just a couple of areas of discussion that this essay at least brings out for me, if any of you wants to respond to any of those. I looked at the dates uh, when I read them to pay particular attention to mm -hmm. what was going on in her own life when she wrote this kind of prose that in some ways was much more freeing for her than uh, um, the other kind of writing that she was doing for the review. And so this one is 1971 and yeah. the whole drama of her separation is going on at the same time that she's uh, rediscovering herself as a writer. Um, uh, and so, um, I think that this is one of these things where the experience of being a woman uh, is being sort of uh, opened up from the inside and she's not calling it that, um, but she's, uh, you know, she's definitely describing this kind of, um, oh, uh, the right to exist uh, in a way. I don't think she's wagging a finger at the guy. Uh, I think the remarkable thing about her perspective as a woman is the absence of recrimination. 
uh, an ideology about, you know, these kind of things. She blames, you know, this sort of historical drift that somehow these things don't have the hold on us that they used to, but change is, you know, uh, a very double-edged thing in her, in her world. But I think this is definitely one of these pieces of starting over for herself, but also sort of trying to locate herself, you know, as a, as a consciousness uh, uh, somehow. Alex, Saskia. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one thing I thought of too is uh, with this essay is that it does seem to me one of the most directly um, autobiographical. I mean, there's always autobiography running throughout all these essays in various ways, but because it's so reflective and begins with that part about, I have never felt free and everything she knows is from books and from worry. Um, which seems to me a very clear-eyed look at her own character, you know, and, and I think that comes through in the Dolphin Letters too. It's, it's, it, these essays in this section, at least the ones written in the 70s, I think I say in the intro is that they are sort of a companion to the Dolphin Letters in a way she's working through um, a lot of the same things, but um, without, without some of the emotions that you do find in the dolphin letters, like moments of recrimination and moments of anger and all of that. It has sort of been filtered through her, uh, her literary mind, I guess you could call it. <laughs> there's a moment in Sleepless Nights when um, um, there's a, she says, I was, I was a, um, what was it again? I was a we then, or I was. Uh, yeah. That uh, tea, bag, tea bag of a word. A tea bag of a word. Um, let me just see if I, yes, I, I was then a we. I want to get her syntax right. Um, and um, there's a man, um, just a he, who is having a drink and saying some things like, uh, the tyranny of the weak is a burdensome thing, and yet it is better to be exploited by the weak than by the strong. Um, and and go on going on with sort of um, uh, statements that are sort of aphoristic uh, generalizations about um, weakness and strength and 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 and, and um, uh, husband wife not a new move to be discovered in that strong classical tradition and then she says can it be that I am the subject. And I think that one of the things that I love about this essay and um, a couple of the others, when you know exactly when you what you read aloud, Merve, um, the self always matters, no matter how great the crisis and disruption of the world. If you are allowed to live, your single, singular, solitary self will be gnawing at you all the time. Is is her um, playing around formally with? Um, um, statements and aphoristic statements. Um, she even talks about it in, in another essay where she, she quotes an aphorism by Frank O'Hara. Um, and how, how to weigh these statements um, is part of the interest and pleasure of reading these essays to me because um, I did exactly what Daryl did. I, I looked at the dates to, to understand um, uh, from her point of view, you know, who is the self that this essay is emerging from and that these statements are emerging from because um, I, I, think it was, I think it was William Empson, although I originally heard it from Christopher Ricks, um, uh, uh, who, was, who was very interested in uh, the distinction between um, uh, the power of, 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 of a proverb and a theory you know, or philosophy and, 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 theory and, and principles. And um, he was very interested in proverbs like, um, look before you leap, um, he who hesitates is lost. And you have to know the context in order to understand which of those is appropriate or right or truthful for that particular moment. And, um, uh, I think that 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 her interest in 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 sort of statement in 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 aphorism and, and that sort of thing, um, why I'm so interested in in the 
anchoring moment in her life that, they, that, that it emerged from, then I can understand something like, I know how to weigh the statements that she's making. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I mean, I think that there are also powerful general statements of use to anybody and you don't need to know the life. But since I do know a little bit about it, I'm, I find myself very moved by that and, and moved by things like, um, uh, we must not ask too much of our work. It is not in the nature of work to be always gratifying. This, this, uh, this um, moving statement about the, the, the burden that we place on work to help us out of um, wasn't you, crisis. Yeah, yeah. yeah Daryl. No, I'm sorry. Um, no, you know, understanding didn't necessarily have, or writing didn't have therapeutic or utilitarian value. You know, understanding was something philosophical. Um, um, and I was just, when you mentioned sleepless night, this is, I've never, I can't remember anywhere else such a forthright statement about motherhood and what it meant for her. Um, because in some ways she's answering the question that would come later of the, did your domestic life keep you from writing more? Uh, and I can't remember what review it was, but someone said her ambition was in her perfectionism, not in her productivity. Um, but she's clearly saying no, that she wouldn't have traded it. And I find that rather touching because she doesn't often touch on something like that in her work, even obliquely and uh, when talking about herself. Sorry, that, that, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Saskia, sorry. Not at all. Uh, that's, that's why all I- The worry for her is always a class term. Uh, mm. When she says that I worry, it's the anxiety of, you know, not being uh, upper class. Uh, and when she talks about sort of the upper class, often the word careless comes up, you know, that sort of, and she means not worried in the way that mm. tends to ha have always been. At yeah, they were careless the people. I take it. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. it was, I, I, I'd be curious, Merve and Alex and, and Daryl, I mean, Daryl, you brought up what she talks about, about motherhood. And I too was so struck by that paragraph and, and the words that she used, this fury, she, she calls it, she calls her enslavement, what, but what an enslavement my feelings were as a mother um, with a small child and, and how she didn't want to be, you know, um, withdrawn from that, no. you know, from those pleasures. But she, her, way, her way of describing it is so interesting. I mean, as an enslavement or um, this fury fortunately abated after a while, but not entirely, you know, um, such, such an interesting choice of word. Fury. Force of nature kind of vocabulary. But, and it's, it's, uh -huh. it's wonderful too that, uh, that the essay ends with her writing, I look at little girls with wonder and with anxiety. I do not know whether they will be free. The only certainty is that many will be adrift. And if that fury has abated, that anxiety about little girls being these selves who are adrift, whose selves will always be gnawing at them, right? That, that anxiety cannot abate. And I like that I love that this essay ends on that note of irresolution, that it it doesn't give us as she uh, opens um, when to cast out, give up, let go, Saskia. She it, it doesn't give us uh, a maxim uh, that we can use therapeutically, as you said, Daryl. And maybe we can look at when to cast out, give up, let go, since it was mentioned as you know offering uh, or opening with the O'Hara proverb. Sure. What's she giving up? What she's casting out? You know, uh, she's talking about how I guess how you change. I think one of the things this moment may find interesting about her work is that it it's it uh, this late period came to her when uh, the second wave feminism was really you know very much sort of in the air, and and people were asking questions from it or of it, and hers was always that the life of women has. Uh, uh, has changed now, uh, and 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 what are the I don't know what what are the consequences of that, and one of them was that for her in her mind that women who had looked for help from men, you know, had to look elsewhere 
uh, and often, uh, of course, to themselves. And that, that brought up a whole different, whole different sort of world of possibility. Uh, at least that's how, you know, these small things you kind of keep thinking about and they get bigger. Uh, her, one of the- There's always a lot of, more in her essays than I think, sorry. Yeah, no, I, and one of the parts of this essay that I really uh, um, admire that seems to me a kind of interesting ethos or, or ethic comes uh, close to the end of it when she writes, Few things are more gratifying to the spirit than the meeting of a person who practices a sort of eternal vigilance, who really asks himself what his life, the life of his family and friends are truly about. This is an enormous effort like signing on for a peculiar regime of calisthenics. To think about a troubled person is to ask what can his life and his problems uniquely mean to him? Where does he hurt and can it be changed? And a little further down, sympathy is a gift, sometimes almost an occupation. Uh, do, do you feel like sympathy was her occupation? Because reading the essays, I often do, even when they are at their most biting, I still feel like that sympathetic imagination, that absence or that purification of recrimination, as you said, Daryl, is, is almost always operative in the prose. So do you think that sympathy was part of her, was her occupation or part of her occupation as, a, as an essayist? Uh, absolutely, because she liked to hear people's stories. Uh, and for her, literature was not an abstraction. It was very much a human drama, you know, about people and, um, um, <clears throat> written by people in a particular time. So yes, you know, I think that she preferred to write from some sympathetic point of view. It opened up feelings for her. Even if she, the sympathy is in defending a form against someone who's done it badly. To be very passionate for the, sake of the form. Uh, but, you know, I think that Again, maybe this is from Saskia that uh, uh, she and Lo liked Hardy because they were about people. His poems were about people. Mm. Are, are there are there moments in any of the essays or Saskia possibly in the letters where you feel like that sympathy fails, or she notes the <laughs> failure of that of that sympathy in herself? Yeah, in herself or, or in, in others, Saskia or Alex, either of you could take that. Yeah. Saskia, maybe you should take it since you are closest to the to the letters where is where it's probably more likely to happen than in the essays. I was thinking about, you know, um I, I just want to just just say Alex did such a beautiful job finding yes. these essays. Um, and I didn't know of the existence of this when I was editing the, the Dolphin Letters. And now I think one of my footnotes is wrong because I think <laughs> she, 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 she writes, she, this, this, um, uh, this essay was written in 73 and uh, I don't know when she wrote it. Um, I think it was published in June in Mademoiselle, Alex, or July or something like that, sometime that summer. Yeah, I think, I think so. June. I think June, right? Am I right? Yeah. Um, and um, there are some really interesting, very moving letters that she writes um, to Lowell um, in that period. And and just for those those who don't know the story um, or the larger context, um, um, Lowell was about to publish this book of poems called The Dolphin. She hadn't yet read it. Um, uh, it was about to come out in June, um, and um, they were finalizing some matters to do with their divorce, including um, um, the sale of a, of a house that had been left to her in Maine, had been left to her by Lowell's cousin. Um, and the understanding was by Lowell's cousin that she wanted to leave it to Elizabeth Hardwick. Um, uh, perhaps have concern about Lowell's stability, but 
but that but that she meant to meant for it to be to both of them. And so the sale of this house was um, very painful, uh, uh, sort of um, for them both in different ways. And she she talks about going up to Maine and um, organizing all of their possessions, their things, as, as uh, she writes about in another one of Alex's essays. Um, and um, uh, there's there's a very interesting moment where Lowell is um, clearly very uh, upset about the sale of this house and um, his feelings about the house having been left to her and not to him by his beloved cousin and and other things and um, uh, I think it's um, th there's a moment when she um, she says uh, um, I cried after I talked to you cried because I do have nice relations with others as you do never acerb argumentative um, she's defending herself against a criticism he has of her um, and um, she's his idea of her was that she was very acerbic and and uh, cutting and perhaps in in those moments um, one could one could interpret those as a failure of sympathy um, although I love Daryl's um, um, shifting of the term to sympathy for the form um, that is being violated in, in some way or, or being disrespected by uh, um, by by a, a poor performance or poor, poor piece of writing. Um, but she didn't like that portrait of her that Lowell had in his mind. And she objected to it, both to him in, in that particular letter, um, which was written um, just a month before the publication of this, this essay. Um, um, and also to um, Robert Lowell's biographer um, later. And she said, you know, Lowell thought that some piece of writing she had done about him would be tremendously gossipy and a Serb. Um, she again uses that form of the word. Um, and um, uh, she destroyed this, this piece of writing because um, it, it didn't satisfy her, but it wasn't, it didn't meet Lowell's expectations. It, it wasn't that, that kind of a piece. So I think that, um, this question of failure of sympathy um, is a really wonderful question, I think, to, to, to carry with one as one reads these um, essays and re resolve her. Um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful way of approaching it. But mm -hmm. Alex, do, would you, I'd be very curious to hear what Alex thinks. Oh, uh, well, I was thinking of the, I think it's Emerson who said it's a luxury to be understood. And I think that Hardwick is she's remarkable in that she she does have a huge understanding of all different kinds of people um and this could be applied to, i mean it's it's obvious in in some of the feminine principle essays if i can use the title of my own section but uh the in the new york city essay which i think we'll talk about uh, a little later too you see all sorts of different people and she extends her sympathy and her compassion to all sorts of different walks of life and uh, and that comes through attention but she also i think um doesn't overextend her sympathy in other words there are people with whom she doesn't not that she's cruel to them but she doesn't uh pretend to sympathize with them very much i mean in the essays on the menendez brothers for example we don't get the sense that she's intensely invested in their oh, no, 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 version no, no. of the story different that's a whole different category right. of observation. Yeah. You know, it's not that human drift that she was she was very moved by. This mm -hmm. is something else. I was I find I found those hardest to read again. Um, mm -hmm. um, because of something missing, but we'll talk about that maybe get a chance to hear it. Well, I mean, I wanted to shift the conversation about sympathy a little bit to talk about the political imagination that is attached to that sympathy. And this chimes with one of the questions we've already gotten in the Q&A. And Saskia, I think it also chimes with that sentence that you read from Sleepless Nights, what if I was the subject? But the, but the subject of that novel is obviously a 
kind of collective subject. I mean, the self continues to gnaw, but there are so many other people who, to use one of her words, are honored by the gaze or by the attention, to use your word, Alex, of the narrator in that novel. And I was thinking about the capaciousness, but also the limitations of that political imagination and its sympathetic outreach when I was reading New York City Crash Course, I, which um, is also in the Uncollected, the first essay in the section entitled Places, People, and Things. And I thought I would just read one paragraph of that and then turn it back over to all of you. I, and it's an interesting paragraph to me. It comes right on the first page. And the essay begins by talking about the old New York airport, which was once called Idlewild. Idlewild. And it, after sort of giving a very scenic description of the city for two paragraphs, it breaks into a question uh, addressed perhaps to the reader, but perhaps to someone else, a kind of invisible person uh, in the wings. Will you not come with me to the shelter? on this icy evening, dear old homeless one, stuffed into your bag of rags and surrounded by upstanding pieces of cardboard, making as it were a sort of private room on the frieze of concrete near a corner or before a storefront. No, you fucking little rat-faced volunteer on vacation from the country club of Wellesley College or piling up credit at the Fordham School of Social Work. I'll die before I take my bag upon bag of nameless litter, my mangy head, my own, my leprous legs, purple scabbed and swollen, my numbed crooked fingers, myself to the city shelter or flop house, whatever you call it. And I'm fascinated in this paragraph, both by that break, the, that, that, that turn to the question form, but also the kind of dialogue that's being staged in this paragraph. Um, between the person who makes the overture and the person who seems to reject it. And I wondered if we could just talk a little bit about how Hardwick's writing on the political imagination, on political collectivity, on the poor, how that has stood the test of, of time. Um, whether that's perhaps one of the reasons as someone in the Q&A points out why she speaks to us today. Uh, because her capacity to band with uh, people, to, to have this imagination, not just of sympathy, but solidarity, feels necessary or something to, something to aspire to right now. Um, I was very, I'd completely forgotten this essay and I was really annoyed that I hadn't <laughs> put it in her short fiction. Uh, 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 it was a real kind of oversight. I'm very happy to see it again. Um, uh, and it's very uh, striking. Um, of course, at the time, you know, the, there was a huge homeless encampment uh, at uh, Columbus Circle, where there's now Whole Foods, it used to be a convention site, and it got overtaken. And sometimes when she walked from her home to the review, she would go down Broadway, not Central Park West, and was fascinated to sort of see this, not fascinated, that's not the right word. Uh, astonished to see this kind of, you know, uh, thing so near sort of Lincoln Center, though she remembered Lincoln Center uh, in its kind of days as a real rundown area before sort of Lincoln Center. But I, what uh, struck me about reading it this time was that her how different her uses of history are from our expectations of how history is going to be used now. I remember when she found that book on the draft riots during the Civil War and how interested she was and also how new these subjects were at the time. Um, 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 but, you know, yes, the past is very much the past in her view of history, not sort of living with us, even if the past has consequences. You know, it still is a very different time in, in her view. She had a very strong sense of, uh, uh, I don't know what um, the linear movement of history was how she understood it. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that sort of, and I think that's very clear uh, in mm -hmm. the essay. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, she'll take every chance uh, uh, in the description 
I think that exchange is clearly between her as the observer mm -hmm. and the homeless person answering. And she has this way of speaking for the person that doesn't violate that person's autonomy. One of the things that makes her a great sort of social observer is not only that she's from someplace else from where she ended up, but everyone she looks at, she gives them a kind of parity with herself. Yeah. So she's never superior to what she's looking at unless it's a pompous fool in power. But, you know, sort of her social encounters are marked by this tremendous fairness of mm -hmm. gaze, I think. Mm. No, I, I would agree. And, and the word, I mean, I think I already mentioned it, but the word that repeats in many of the essays in Seduction and Betrayal, Daryl, in many of the essays that you've put together and also in Sleepless Nights is, is honor. Mm. That's the word. And, and to honor someone is to treat them with a kind of parody, right? To assume that their being is equal to yours. And that's what's so striking to me about the many, many scenes in Sleepless Nights when she's talking about the women who do housework, yes. the, the neighbors that she sees walking on the street with torn stockings. Yes. And those details never feel like mockery. They never feel cruel. Uh, they, they always feel like they are part and parcel of the project of honoring yes. that person. And it's extraordinary because in a less agile person's hands, they could so very easily become a means of poking fun. I uh, but just revealing something the, per the yeah, like, writer yeah. is unaware of. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. There's another essay in Alex's collection where she sort of talks about how house housework has sort of mm -hmm. lost its honor or something, but actually the retired housewife is as valuable as the retired secretary or something. I can't I can't yeah. phrase things the way she does. And that's always important, as Saskia said. But uh, uh, the, the, I think this book is full of things I didn't know about, uh, and her in a different register. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think it's very well done. Congratulations to Alex. And, uh, Thanks, the Alex. You you were the one who chose uh, New York City Crash Course for our conversation. Oh, yeah. What I mean, do you want to add to what what Daryl has just said yeah. about her sense of her sense of history and the way that that plays out in the essay? Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, remarkable to me because uh, there are things uh, I don't think I knew about till I read this essay, or I certainly wouldn't have thought to, to put together, despite having read a fair amount of New York history. And, um, you know, the, the part where she talks about Captain Kidd as the classic New Yorker, uh, he's, he has done no wrong, but he has been perjured against by dishonest people or whatever the, the line is. Um, but I mean, the thing that really strikes me about the essay above all is the way she's able to move from one place to another, literally in the city, but also these transitions in the essay as you were talking about, it, here it's this voice with this, this question or this question and answer, but she has all sorts of different ways of getting you from one place to the next or one scene to the next. Um, which it's not that you don't notice, but you love being taken along and there's something almost physically exciting about her prose. I mean, in many of the essays and almost all the essays I hope in the collection, but especially this one in a way. Mm. Um, what do you make of the turn to Whitman at the very end of this essay, which was extremely striking to me. Sorry to ask you as the, as the, as the poet in the, in the, in the bunch, but I was surprised to, I don't know why I was surprised to find the essay sort of ultimately ending or landing like the plane that's about to land on, on Whitman. Uh, well, it's, it's Whitman, it's, it's a wonderful quote from Whitman, um, keep your fields of clover and Timothy and your cornfields and orchards, keep the blossoming buck field, buckwheat fields where the, the, nine, the ninth month bees hum, give me faces and streets, Give me these phantoms incessant and endless along the trottoirs. Uh, I, I love that. Um, uh, I think she finds in that passage, because Whitman, of course, writes wonderfully about the countryside as well, but, um, uh, uh, you know, kindred spirit in, 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 in her love for what, there's one letter to Lowell where she, or, or maybe, maybe it was Mary McCarthy, I can't remember, where she writes about um, 
back to the sullen streets from the sullen north, um, both quotations from, um, uh, from Mel one from Melville and one from somewhere else. But uh, she, uh, she also writes about it in Sleepless Nights, her just her love of um, the, uh, uh, just the, 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 it's like, she talks about the, the trash truck trucks on, on 67th Street being like bird song to her. Um, her love of, um, of multiplicity and, and, um, um, and the, the, the big bustling city and the, you know, the, uh, uh, the spectacular warehouse, she calls it, folk from everywhere, especially from those sunny sovereignties to the south of us coming to peer out of blackened windows. Um, uh, so I, I think she just sees in Whitman in that moment a, a sort of um, uh, a fellow spirit. But, but, but it's interesting too, to think back to the moment when she says, and going back to your, 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 your question about politics and, and, and to go back to that moment in Sleepless Nights when she says, can it be that I am the subject that um, a friend of mine was saying about her, um, we were just talking about it and she was saying the search to be the subject, not someone's object is, um, you know, part of what, what that, that novel does and, 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 and some of these essays do as well. Um, and, um, and, and as you say, Merve, it's, it's, a, it's a, a collectivity, not just, uh, just herself, her solitary self. Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> no, please tell me. No, no. Please tell I think me. she's always, you know, very possessive of, her, of herself. You know, she sort of is in coalition with others, but she worked too hard to achieve this self to, as she says, sort of surrender. I'm also struck that uh, crash course, she's in her 70s already. And, uh, you know, New York, this very dangerous place the whole time she lived here, isn't the sense of New York that comes across in her work at all. Uh, instead of being a place of threat for women, uh, though, of course, she understood that. It's also the woman's ally uh, that, you know, somehow in this multitude, there was protection uh, for uh, women and their kind of cast adrift or uh, not cast adrift, but whatever the phrase was at the beginning, mm -hmm. that somehow the city was the proper place for a single woman, I think is very strong in her work. And Daryl, to go back to um, something you once said beautifully, I think about the encounters in Sleepless Nights with um, the women who come and help to clean or whatever that, that I mean, this is just reiterating what you've already said, but um, that they, they always look right back at her, you know? All right, yeah. Um, so, so it is true. And, and, and you know, as, as you were saying, so I can, I can take, a, take back what I was saying, but, um, uh, that you know, if, if if she if she claimed herself and possessed herself, um, she allowed the others to claim their, themselves uh, and possess themselves. As well. Also, you know, she thought of her or understood her own the what she wanted or admired was the radical sensibility. So since she wasn't into ideology at all, you know, this kind of uh, 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 identification. Uh, with uh, uh, invisible lives is in a way part of her radicalism. And just as she didn't want to write about Lowell partly because he expected her to, she didn't want to write about the class she married into or the world she lived in. You know, she, she never wanted to write about uh, intellectual New York. And, uh, mm. you know, uh, I remember, she, yeah, never mind. Well, I, I just wanted to riff off of another question that we received in the Q and A um, about who she was writing for, and whether the audience that she imagined is still an audience that exists with us today. Um, and I, I wanted to ask that question actually by way of an essay that I was hoping we could talk about and Saskia that you mentioned also, which is her reading essay that comes toward the end of the uncollected. Um, Alex, which section is this in? Do you remember? 
Oh, readings. Yes, of course, readings. So on reading the writings of women, reading and Southern yeah. literature, the cultural assumptions of regionalism. That was amazing. And, yeah, and, and I, was, I was struck by this paragraph. To speak of a passion for reading is rather self-aggrandizing as perhaps it would not have been in the past. This act, except for purposes of the classroom or for information, is self-propelled, unmortgaged, so to speak, not subject to obsolescence or engine trouble or the need for maintenance. It is not often that one is scolded for it, although biographies tell of the wishes of parents to interrupt on behalf of unchopped wood or expensive candles. Perhaps the love of or the intense need for reading is psychological, an eccentricity, even something like a neurosis, that is a pattern of behavior that persists beyond its usefulness, which is controlled by inner forces and which in turn controls. I love so many different parts of that, but the question I have for you, maybe like I said, riffing on the question in the Q&A is, are there fewer neurotics, reading neurotics today uh, than there used to be? Is this a passion that has still outlived its usefulness. Um, what would she make of the market for reading materials? Uh, Alex, as you put it in the introduction, or as she puts it in her introduction to the best American essays, what, should, what would she make of the state of essayism versus journalism versus information? Um, how has this part of the landscape changed since this essay was written, which is 1983. Maybe just, is it an eccentricity? Yeah, is it a psychological eccentricity? Are we all neurotics? Probably, yeah. Um, I would, <laughs> I would think though that uh, because I, I, I see the, the book recommendations that New York Review of Books gets, there seem to be plenty of neurotics still out there reading, reading away. But it's. Um, but I do think that the, just to take one part of the question that the, the audience that she imagined must have changed just because people change from decade to decade, generation to generation. And I do think some of her references, not that they were really very apparent probably to her contemporaries are probably slightly less apparent to readers mm -hmm. who come to her today, but you know, um, it just takes a bit of Googling and uh, looking around and paying attention um, because she will slip in um, a sort of half made up quote from Thomas Hardy or something like that in the middle of an essay. Right. And, and you have to sort of figure out where that's coming from or what that might mean. Yeah, yeah. or I think, I think Maggie Doherty in a recent piece on Hardwick put it nicely where she said, you know, it, she said of Hardwick's writing, um, you know, if you didn't know who Proust was, bully for you. Uh, that there is an assumption of, uh, or, or a, I don't know if it's an assumption or a challenge to right. have read all that she has, all that she has read. And I, I like, I mean, that's one of the things I greatly, greatly admire about the, about the essays and about this essay on reading in particular. Yeah, the, in the introduction to the best American essays, which I used as the art of the essay. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of the book, she says, you know, an essayist will not say Picasso, a Spanish painter who lived long in France. You know, don't identify who you're talking about. <laughs> so. No, she really disliked that kind of a editorial recommendation. You know, that you had to explain things because her own style was so condensed. Um, um. I, I, my favorite part actually from that art of the essay is when she writes, how often we read a beginner's review that compares the thin thing to a fat one. John Smith, like Tolstoy, is very interested in the way men interact under the conditions of battle. Well, no. <laughs> and I think that's really fantastic. Oh, look. Sorry. No, that's it. That's okay. Hello. <laughs> I think also she was very clear. Uh, she was, we would say, an essentialist uh, in her feeling about literature, and she always said, "You can't, uh, you can't teach writing. 
uh, but a passion mm -hmm. for reading can be shared and she would conduct her classes by you know sort of reading to students and trying to get them to hear uh, what she heard and mm -hmm. she very was very drawn to uh, the uh, small seemingly random lyrical work you know mm -hmm. sort of Baudelaire or Laforgue or real mm -hmm. people like that but it was always very clear that she wrote for the literature she cared about mm -hmm. You know, that her ambition was really very deep and she wanted someone weird to find her on a shelf years from when she wasn't around anymore herself. And that seems to be going on, so good for the weird people. <laughs> I think maybe that as we come to the end of the hour is is the best possible note that we could oh, end on. Oh no, go ahead, Saskia, did you wanna, did you wanna add something there? No, oh, did, Daryl, did you have a question for me? No, I was saying, do you want to say something? Oh, no, no. I thought that that was such a beautiful way to end, um, you know, uh, perfect. So yeah, good, good for the weird people. And I hope that all the weird people who have been watching tonight or who will watch the recorded version of this later will buy the uncollected essays, the collected essays, the dolphin letters, the dolphin, and I can't hold any more she would of these wonderful, very these wonderful audience members' books. By the things you wrote about her, uh, she would be really, um, I think, uh, honored by that. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And Noah, I'll do you have any technical things you need to say at the end here? That's pretty much it. You've done my job for me, Mervé. You're a great okay. bookseller. Um, just thank you all again <laughs> for a really fantastic, insightful, thoughtful conversation. Those of you at home, thank you for your thoughtful questions. Please consider purchasing a copy of the Uncollected Essays from Community Bookstore or your favorite local indie. We hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thanks again. Take care. Congratulations, Alex. Congratulations. Congrats. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye.